don't see anything wrong with helping your parents in their trade. However, that should not take the place of going to school. And also, um, early marriage. In certain parts of Ghana, it's not in all parts, normally up north. Because down south, it's a little easier. I mean, our cultural norms and practices are such that we do not um, get children, I would say children, because they are not um, at the age where they should be married, we don't push them into marriage. But up north, especially in the polygamous society, you have men at the age of say 60, 70, 80, who are getting married to children who are 15, 16, and you can imagine what the repercussions of that are and the consequences of that are. And therefore, of course, if a child is getting married at the age of 14, 15 or 16, how is she going to go to school? How is she going to have any formal education? And therefore, that's one of the things that uh, is, is, is bothersome. I mean, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. Another thing which I've spoken about already is male dominance. Unfortunately, in the African society, it's still there. And I'm sure in other societies as well. I can only speak for Ghana. We've come a long way. We have a ministry of gender uh, and social protection. And we're looking at girl child. We're looking at women who are being you know, abused or women who are going through trying circumstances. And to set up a whole ministry for that, in my opinion, <coughs> is a step in the right direction. However, what are we doing with that ministry? They have their limitations. Funding is a problem. Um, government can only give up so much money for these things. And therefore we have the bilaterals, we have the multilaterals, we have the NGOs who are coming in to help. But in my opinion, they've been focusing on things that are important, yes, but I've done a bit of research on the areas that they are looking at. They are looking at educational campaigns and policy formulation. Um, they are looking somehow at the attitudinal and belief systems, which, you know, culture comes as a part of it. And they are trying to educate parents on the need to take their girl child to school. My parents, first generation, not educated. My mom was an only child and she happened to be a girl. So my grandfather said, you know what, I'm not going to let my only child not be educated. And my mom was extremely bright. So my, my grandfather said, Why, let's take her to school. So she'll do her house chores, fetch her water in the morning, because she came from a typical rural setting. Fetch her water um, on certain days, probably will have to dash to the farm, come back, and still go to school. My mom ended up in the college that I went to, the Archibald School, which was a Prince of Wales College at the time. Very good school. Finished, came to this country, and went to a college in Bath. And then, of course, she met my father here. He was in Guy's and St. Thomas's at the time. They got married, came back home. It's pretty obvious that my mom was not going to not educate her girl child because she realized the benefits of girl child education. But if you don't start from somewhere and that vicious cycle is not broken, you're never going to get there. First generation not educated, second generation not educated, obviously. If you're not careful, the third generation, which is our generation, is not going to be educated because they don't really see the benefits of, of girl-child education, you know, from that perspective. The NGOs and stuff are also doing things, providing teachers, and it's a pity Susan is not here because she's doing a project in Nigeria which apparently is taking female teachers from here back to Nigeria, the northern part of Nigeria, to teach, you know, um, teachers who teach females how to concentrate on the girl child. And I think it's a very laudable project. But this is what the NGOs and the, the multilaterals are doing. They are trying to get schools to be closer to the home. Because remember I told you my mom will have to go fetch water and after fetching water we'll still have to go to school. If her school in the rural setting is say five kilometers away from where she lives, that's a, that's a disincentive because she comes back, she's tired. The parents say, yes, she can go to school. By the time she goes to school, they are halfway through the, the, the day. So they are trying to bring schools closer to where um, the girls live. And that, that hopefully should help. 
they're giving scholarships to girls, which is fantastic because if uh, somebody has a limited budget, a parents, I mean, a set of parents have a limited budget, obviously their, their um, concentration is going to be on the male child. And therefore, there's no extra income to take the female child to school. So if you have scholarships which are slated specifically for the female uh, child, then it's a good thing because then they, the parents don't have to pay. Another thing that was done in the time of John Kufo was um, school feeding because that's also a big problem. Don't forget poverty is, is quite still quite rife in, in a part of the world where I come from. And therefore, food in the morning for the child is also a problem. And if I'm not saying if you're going to feed anybody, they'll feed the male child, but there's so little to go around that uh, that we don't do, <laughs> you know. I mean, you don't quote me anywhere and say they feed the male child and leave the female child. That, that's not what happens. However, of course, if there's provision for breakfast, it's an incentive for the child to go to school because then the parents, you know, uh, just have to feed the child probably once a day. So that's all being done by all these NGOs have spoken about. However, the limitations of these current interventions I realize that um, we have the mentorship thing and you have the mentor and the mentee. It's most of the kind of mentorship programs that we're practicing back home are a one-on-one -on -one, um, mentorship program. How realistic is that? You are a mentor and you have probably 10 people you're supposed to be mentoring. You're supposed to be keeping up with with what they're doing you're supposed to be keeping in touch constantly and you're supposed to act as a role model for them however the people who have offered to do this mentoring are people who are re doing regular jobs like you and I and therefore some of them are mothers as well professional women how much time do you have to keep that constant to keep in constant touch with these girls so the sustainability for me the idea is a fantastic one however the sustainability for me is a problem the other thing is um the emphasis i realize back home is on uh, corporate um, things for example you get people going to a secondary school talking about who they are what they do i'm, I'm a banker I'm a finance director here, um, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, and these are the things. So they do a whole fantastic um, um, presentation, PowerPoint presentation on um, finance and how you can become an entrepreneur. They're good, and they give the children certain principles to sort of go by. But how much of that is going to directly impact on their lives? and especially the social aspect of their lives. So for me, I was looking at it and thinking, how do I slot in trying to help the girl child or trying to mentor the girl child? I'm a doctor. I'm still a physician to the head of state and his former head of state and his family. I'm very involved with church work. And if I'm going to add this and be a mentor and say mentor um, 10 girls, where they have to constantly be in touch with me. How realistic is that? Am I going to be able to sustain it? So I looked at the old model, which is role modeling. And role modeling can be a one-time contact, which is what I was doing in the church program. Those girls saw me once, and I was telling some friends of ours, we just met here, and I was telling them, there were seven girls who came back to me after the program. I spoke for 15 minutes, and they said to me, you know what, we've been trying to do medicine and we, 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 we think we want to do it, but you have inspired us. The story you've told is a very real one and we're going to try and do medicine. It wasn't even about medicine. For me, it wasn't about doing medicine. You could do anything else. But the fact that that story was an inspirational one, three of them ended up doing medicine. The others were doing biomedical sciences and because of course they were science based. But it wasn't even about that. I said to myself, I spoke to over 150 girls. If I had seven of them coming back with that 15 minute stint that I had with them, saying that what your story inspired us and we're excited to achieve, for me that was, was, was good. 
So I said, let me go back to that role modeling um, concept. But can I do it alone? Absolutely not. I can't go to the schools and only speak to these girls and say, you know, look at me. Look where I came from. Look at where I am now. And so you speak for 15 minutes and then pretty much that's it. Because you don't want to bore them also with what the name of your secondary school was, name of your primary school. And, you know, who cares, really? But you want to leave certain things with them and certain principles. So I started calling around. Some of my friends are entrepreneurs, some of them are nurses, some of them are, you know, um, doctors like myself, some of them are corporates and, you know, the finance world, and they were excited about it. I said, go out there, let's put this project together, which I have titled The Story of Our Lives Project, because that is really what it's about. We're telling the real story. We are not embellishing it. We are not only telling them the good sides of the story, but we're telling them what really happened in our lives, our challenges. Second year med school, I fell ill. I went back. When you miss one week of med school, it takes you a month to catch up. And I missed a month. So obviously when I got back, we were a few weeks to our exams and I had to take a decision. Was I going to repeat the year? Was I going to write the exams and fail? Which was going to leave me totally devastated. So I decided no, I would, you know, take the exam at the referral, you know, for the next sitting. Everybody thought I was crazy because they said, if you take it at the referral and you don't pass, you're going to have to repeat the year. So the dean of the medical school called me and said, I don't think you're taking a wise decision. Go and do the exam. If you fail, so what? I said, no, I want to be ready for that exam. Went and did the referral. The two subjects I hated the most were the ones I passed in. The one I loved the most was the one I failed in. <laughs> so, of course, I had to go back and repeat the year. So that was a, a very, very difficult period for me because wherever I'd been, I had been, you know, doing very well, outstanding, and so that aspect of my life. But what did I do? I didn't just sit back and twiddle my thumbs and start crying and, you know, and I just carried on. And this is a story you want to, you don't want to tell the girls, everything has all been, you know, blitz and glamour for me, no problems at all, you know, so you're not going to, you want to tell them the challenges you've had. Typical things like relationship challenges. We all have been there. You go into a relationship where you're young, totally excitable, happy, and then, you know, in those days, it was, you know, in those days, there were all these letters, you know, because then, in, well, in my time at the time, it wasn't email and, you know, airmail letters, you know, and then they will mail a letter to you and you're excited when your letter comes through, but you read the letter and you probably have to wear your glasses and say, I think I've been dumped, you know, by my friend. So, you know, there are all these little things that we all went through. But like you're laughing now, if I told those 200 girls in every region, they can relate to what I'm talking about. Unfortunately for us, adolescent sexual health back home again is virtually a taboo subject. Parents, women, don't, mothers don't even talk to their children about these things. You don't even speak about it. So these children are making mistakes left, right, center. And I mean they are making major mistakes. Back home as well, having taken the decision to have children or not to have children is not your decision. So these children go and get themselves pregnant at a very early age. What happens to them? There's no support. Your parents are totally embarrassed. They don't even want anybody to know. And then there's no support system coming from the government either. So what happens? You go out there, you're left on your own, go and make even more, more, you know, more mistakes. And so we have an adolescent, we have two adolescent sexual health um, experts who are women as well and are going to join this uh, Story of Our Lives project. So we're going to go around. There are going to be four of us from different backgrounds and the adolescent sexual health person. It's going to be a one-time contact once a year and it's going to be 200 girls from each region. Ghana is divided into regions. So it's 200 girls from each region. The northern regions, there are 10 regions, but the northern regions are smaller. So we are bunching them all up. So basically we are going to be talking to 1,600 girls every year. Tell them the story of our lives. 
and encourage them to be able to achieve, tell them the real things. We're not going to end there because what if you make an impact on this girl and she wants to get back in touch with you? Unfortunately, we can't have the mentor-mentee relationship in that sense. However, we have a website that we set up and they're going to be able to email us. And I've told my colleagues who are going to be with me, if you don't have time for this project, don't even start it because you don't want to go and promise those children and they see you, they are totally excited. Send you an email, a two-line email. I'm struggling because, you know, I've had a bad day and my boyfriend just dumped me. And then there's no response for another month. What's the point? Well, did you help the person or you rather, you know, uh, um, created a false sense of security for that person? So I've got each of them to commit to what we're doing. Two, twice, at least twice a week, go on that email, check see who is addressing you particularly and we're going to encourage the girls to address particular people if you want to address dr anda go ahead if you want to address uh, gloria go ahead but make sure that you have that really sometimes they would want to address dr anda on a health issue and they want to address somebody else on a totally different issue so we're going to make sure that we they're having that personal contact it's not going to be that robotic thing where Somebody who has no knowledge is going to be managing the website. Oh, I got dumped by my boyfriend. The person responds, never mind, it's going to be fine. You know, so w what have you done then? You haven't done much. So these ladies have committed and a lot of them are very excited about it because I believe in giving back to society. Society has made us what we are definitely made me who I am and I think that it is time to give back it's not everything you do and that's why you're here I presume this is not something where we are sitting having this discussion and afterwards once you get to the door you're going to be handed an envelope with some money in it it's things that you're doing to increase your knowledge on what is happening to give back to society if you can to join a good initiative if it is possible to contribute in your own small way and I hope after I've said this, people would say at some point, oh, you know, Amma, we really want to come to Ghana. And, and it's funny, sometimes people want to come to a country to just explore. They want to come and spend time. They want to be part of an initiative you're doing, but they don't know anybody. So they don't, how do you go to a country when, you know, you, you make contact with somebody on the internet? It's a very dangerous thing to do. You get to the airport, there's nobody to meet you. Person doesn't actually exist. And then you realize that, you know, you've bitten more, you, more than you can chew. But when you are in touch with real people who are doing real things, then when you, you put your heart and everything into it and you come, you have somebody or you have people who are going to take you around. And, and another thing, I always say that this project, when I go to people for sponsorship, I tell them with or without your sponsorship, this project will have to go on. I said, if I have to do two regions and not eight for the time being, I will put in money and make sure that it is done. Because sometimes we rely so much on, on sponsorship from outside. It's like, oh, well, there's no money now, so the project can't come on. Realistically, yes but you have to start something. And sometimes people want to see you start and say, what have you done? And you say, well, I've done this, I've done that. I did it in two regions, but I intend to do it in. I remember somebody was asking me, is it just going to be in Ghana? I said, well, for now, yes, unfortunately, <laughs> because if I say I'm going to extend it to the whole of West Africa, things are done stepwise. You can't just, you know, get up and hit the road running. I wish I had Room, room for uh, a room full of money where I could just you know take all of that and and, and start working at it. But um, so that's really the description of our project, and um, it's not only going to be that. Soft skills, very important. Uh, that's the last thing I'm going to talk about. Where we come from, for example, it will be difficult for a typical Ghanaian child girl especially to come and sit with oh, I saw all your profiles because they send them so that I know who I'm speaking to but to come and sit you know being very confident and because you're talking girl child this and you're talking this assertiveness you know that commitment being able to to speak to people being able to 
to to um, have a conversation. I came in here and I didn't know anybody. I know people by name, but I don't know anybody by face, of course, apart from Roberta and Gloria. But I didn't come in here timid, you know, hiding behind the couch or standing in a little corner. But unfortunately, that is what is happening with, with, with a lot of our girls. You know, very highly educated. Formal education, A1. Got all A's, B's. Then you come to school, for example, in the United Kingdom, go to America, and they're so timid, you know, in the class where you are discussing something. They know it, but they haven't been taught to speak out and say, I know it, you know, or this is what I think. So that aspect of things is also an area that I'm very interested in looking into and telling them that you can be assertive without being aggressive. For me, aggression is, you know, because you're already going there thinking, well, I'm a girl and people, or I'm a woman, people are definitely going to look down on me. So, hey, you know, go in there in a very bombastic way, trying to let everybody notice you. That's not what it's about. It's just about going in there, fitting in, and also, you know, your quota is very important. Go in there and play the role that you're supposed to play. Another thing that is important, which we don't talk about, is, for example, Basic things like table manners, you know. You don't have to come from a wealthy background. I mean, you won't see a child even in the rural setting who has never seen a spoon. It's, it's not possible. They have seen a spoon. But how do you use that spoon? How do you use that fork? How do you use that knife? So I'm part of a project that is already going with the hotels. There's a good hotel in African Regent. I'm by no means advertising for them. But they've been so helpful. They have this... Um, project that's going, they go around all the schools that in their, their community, the rural schools, the urban schools, and teach them those skills. You go into a restaurant, I remember when I came here, um, I, I started working with the head of state, and you go to all these very, you know, posh places like we are in now, and the Landmark Hotel was a place where we would stay when we came in, and I remember one time we went for a very high profile dinner and they served oysters. I was used to oysters being out of the shell and not in their shell. Because back home we take them out and we put them on skewers and you know we eat them like that. Oh, there's this oyster in the shell and I thought <laughs> oh well. But something my mom taught me and that is so typical if you don't have the knowledge you will go and you just mess up. My mom didn't teach me how to take oysters out of the shell but she said to me when you go and you don't know, just watch. <laughs> yeah. She says, pretend you are, you know, doing something. Oh, my glasses or something. <laughs> and then you're just watching what everybody else is doing because they know. So, so I said, oh, okay. So I got chatty with somebody was looking around the table. I thought, okay, this is the way to do it. Took it and very confidently, I'm glad it didn't, you know how sometimes it would just pop off the plate and everybody's, you're totally embarrassed. Luckily, we don't blush, so because if you do, everybody will, sorry, I make these jokes sometimes, but these are things you'll remember, you know. So I looked around and I thought, it was good practice for me because we were invited by the Queen to Buckingham Palace on a state visit. So you can imagine, if I didn't know, you know, and we went for a state banquet, which, and I was sitting right next to the Queen's physician, and this is an old man who has been in there for a long time, trust me. And he was, in, you know, he says, oh, are you the physician to, to Mr. Kufu? I said, yes. And he said, that is so interesting. So is it just you? I said, yes, just me. I'm sure he was looking for the other physician because he's thinking, look at me, I'm 70 plus or something. And this little girl is telling me that she's, you know, the, the president's physician. So we got talking. And of course, I kept observing, making sure I wasn't doing the wrong thing. We had been adequately briefed, though, before we came on how to, to greet and how not to speak before the Queen speaks and all of this. So, but of course, if I was so timid and I didn't have the upbringing my parents gave me, because my parents will take us to a restaurant once in a while, so that we had that confidence to, to get out there, not everybody, the rural children may not have the opportunity to go to the kind of restaurant I went to. However, with these initiatives and with that talk in the secondary school, basic things that they should know that they don't know about, you can start from somewhere. And that whips up their interest to even learn more. 
and it also whips up their interest to go out there and, and be a little, it takes time. But that one-time contact, in my opinion, is something that I hope will, um, will impact their lives. And we're doing this scientifically. Don't forget, I'm a scientist by training, and therefore we're not just going to do this and collect no data at all. We have to collect data and afterwards do a complete evaluation and see what impact what we're doing is, is having on these girls. So I'm totally excited about it. I don't know whether I've whipped up any excitement in you about this project. And um, another thing, grab opportunities when they have them. I grabbed the opportunity when the head of state said, you know, I'd like you to be my physician. I could have said, no, no, I can't. I can't. Yes, I said I can't. But I wasn't shaking and being all nervous. And I went and said to my husband, we have a young family. He said, go for it, you know. Um, luckily, I also have a spouse who has some exposure. And it's unfortunate that we don't have a lot of time because there's this whole documentary that was done about me um, because of the role that I played and the fact that it was a very unusual role. The, for example, the BBC of Ghana, which is the GTV, um, decided to do a 15-minute documentary on me and they spoke to my husband and my husband is very open-minded. That's another thing. With this whole male dominance thing, the men in Africa tend to be, and I, I'm not being cautious in saying this, because even at a certain level where you expect them to be able to give you that support, they're getting there, but it's taking a while. My husband was fully supportive. I'll leave these two little girls with him. It was only when he had to do the round to the bathroom or something that was a little bit <laughs> stressful <laughs> for him. But otherwise, he'll make sure, and back home we have a lot of help. So he'll make sure that the nannies are doing what they are meant to be doing and totally supportive. So if you have a supportive partner, it really does help. And that helped me. However, having said that, majority of people don't have that support. And therefore, it makes it difficult for them to be able to manage. But I grabbed the opportunity. Opportunities come your way, and it, it's in my book. Uh, Gloria, where's the book? I launched this book, uh, The President's Physician, um, in May last year. And um, it's, uh, I don't know, Gloria has read it. Yes. And um, it's a very, it's a very interesting, or at least that's what uh, people say, very readable. I didn't use all this big language and big words because sometimes it's boring having to read a book with all this um, extraordinary language and then having a dictionary beside you. Okay, no, now we don't use dictionaries. You have your phone. Okay, what does this mean? And then you don't want to come back to the book. But in this case, it's very readable and it tells you what my ups and downs were and how I got to where I got to and what I'm doing now, what I hope to be doing. I was very honored to have two heads of state. Um, one of them, uh, as I mentioned, His Excellency Olusegun Basanjo, he wrote the foreword for the book because he's very passionate about the girl child. And my, um, the former president of Ghana insisted on writing a message in the, for the book. And I said to him, the foreword has been written, so what are you going to write? He said, it's a message from me. <laughs> he said, okay, fine. So I thought, okay, that's like a half page thing. And then he wrote it, he writes these things himself. He wrote it and I, I was so curious to read it before I went into the book because I wasn't sure what he was saying. <laughs> but he said very fantastic things. It's worth. So we're trying to get corporate sponsors from all over the world to sponsor 200 books, 400, 20, 10, 5, you know, for this project. So that these girls walk away with this is by no means the, the thing to go by. But then what I can't say in that half an hour stint of speaking with them would be in here. And they are bound to identify with something in here. Whether it's to do with relationships, it's to do with commitment to duty, it's to do with my challenges and all of that. You know, it's in here. So I think I've spoken uh, for a while. And as I said, this is not a lecture by any means. It's a, an open discussion. And um, I hope uh, any questions that come, come up, comments, contributions, um, uh, people who are interested in this project. And I, I'm serious about you coming to Ghana. Ghana is a lovely place. And um, 
you would love it, especially if you come and you're coming to me. <laughs> <laughs> if I say so myself. No, but you know, uh, that it, 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 is, it is great. And uh, it will be lovely to see people like you on this ch girl child drive. I mean, we, we haven't put down any names that this person must go and that person must go. But it will be great to see people who are interested in it. And I'd say, you know what, I went and spoke in this place and this lady is somebody whose story you want to listen to. Some people have been in finance and are now in, in fashion. And that's something I did. In med school, I was making clothes to sell. <laughs> and that bought me my first car. And my father got worried. He said, what are you doing? I thought you were supposed to be med decal school, <laughs> meaning you're supposed to have books this high. And in those days, there was nothing like going on the internet and checking up on things that had just started. So we had books that stick, and you had to read. And you know, so he wondered what time I had to you know, make all those clothes and, and sell. And I was selling from my room and you know, putting the money in my pocket and opened my, my bank account and bought one little car, which I it was zipping around in. And, and for me, it was also a talent that I had. And I definitely uh, you know, took up the challenge. I said, I will do this. I opened a shop. Unfortunately, my mom fell ill and I had to concentrate on that. So I closed that shop, but that shop was making me much more money than medicine ever will. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just snapped up the opportunity and, and did that as well. So that's another thing you tell the girls that don't let it just be your profession. Do other things. Mm -hmm. Involve yourself in other extracurricular, th extra, extracurricular activities. Sports, designing, helping others, you know, and, and all of that, which is something we don't do much back home. Once you're a doctor, you're supposed to be just a doctor. Stick to medicine and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So some of us are more the, the, the you know, the, uh, I wouldn't say, I don't want to use some very strong words, but we're outside the norm. And uh, you're encouraging more people to, to do that as well, because it's done a lot for me. Absolute pleasure speaking to you. And I hope that uh, people will make a few comments and I'll take them in very good faith. Thank you very much. Um, and what we try to do ourselves as, as a foundation is to create opportunities and safe spaces where you actually have the girls and you have people that mentor them, providing role models so they can see, oh, this is what a teacher, a female teacher would, would look like. And this is what I could also aspire to do. <laughs> and it's just skills such as negotiation skills, you know, telling them about certain skills because obviously there are issues like early marriage, um, gender-based violence and, 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 uh, and things like that that you have to inform them about and how they can actually navigate around those issues by giving them the, the skills and the tools. And decision-making skills, uh, negotiation skills, these are the kind of things that they need at this very vulnerable age within the adolescence because this is when these big choices are being made whether to get married whether to stay in school etc so this is what we do basically trying to provide them with that those life skills support whether it's in health or whether it's in you know livelihood aspects as well just to prepare them for that transition you know from the childhood into into adulthood but yeah. Dr. Amma, I think, is doing an amazing thing. Which yeah, I mean, because, as I'm saying, they, they are focusing, the NGOs and, and stuff are focusing. But having said that, we're definitely going to mention it during our, cause our, our presentation or our discussion with them would be incomplete if you go there and, as you say, just say, I've strived and achieved to be and, and that kind of thing, and turn a blind eye to the realistic things that are going on and the kinds of backgrounds they are coming from. Mm -hmm. So it would be, yes ma'am. You talk, you talked about the difference between sort of North and South Ghana mm -hmm. um, and we've talked about uh, sort of cultural issues and, uh, and societal expectations. How does your program um, address resistance, whether that's from the Northern more polygamous society or whether it's generally from the fabric of society within, you've got a mum and dad but they, they don't want to they may want to resist the educational process for their for their child, or they just simply 
have not been given the tools themselves, so they resist against your program. How do you deal with that resistance? Well, um, what's happening is that we're dealing directly with the schools. So we're, we're you know, they're going to pick 200 girls from their school, and we're dealing more with the boarding schools because, um, for now, yeah. we will deal with the day schools as well. But the parents don't necessarily have a say in, in what they take. The, the children go to school. And then those girls are chosen, 200 girls out of, you know, um, or 20 girls out of each school are chosen to come for this program. Unfortunately, we can't do larger numbers because it's not realistic. Um, with time, probably we'll be able to. But 20 girls out of the school are chosen to go for this talk. And so the parents, it's only after they've been for the talk that the parents will probably find out that they did go for this talk. But they won't have a direct say in, because if we're going to ask for parental consent, which my daughter's school doesn't do. They just say, well, the children are going for a talk, um, you know, uh, on, on, on role models. Nobody's going to necessarily kick against that. So they don't, the, the, the parents don't necessarily no, come. So come. If you're sorry to interrupt you, but you're no, it's fine. sort of collecting data from a scientific perspective. So mm -hmm. what is your, you know, what's the positive negative output of your program? Yeah. So potentially, if somebody doesn't know, whether it's whether it's it, it, it's it's a male-dominated society anyway, but the differences between a polygamous society and a monogamous society, or the fabric of <laughs> of, of how people live and, and culture, is that some just some data that you would be looking to? Collect? No, I mean for this particular program, the data we are collecting is the impact of our role modelling okay. on the girls. That's what we're looking at because this is not it's not a new concept, but it's an older concept where that first that yeah. one time contact because now they're focusing more on repetitive, you know, as I said, the mentor mentee relationship. But this is going to be one time contact, just telling them 15 minutes, 20 minutes of the story of your lives. Does it make a difference? It made a difference in the schools I spoke in, but was it a fluke? Or did it really impact the girls? That, that is what our focus is going to be on. We are not looking necessarily at the backgrounds, because don't forget, there are going to be 200 girls. Mm -hmm. We're not collecting so much data of where they are coming from. And through the website, you're going to get that information. Because somebody is probably going to ask a question and say, you know, I tried to tell my father that I wanted to be a doctor, but he said, no, stop and go and do nursing because nurse, nurses, you know, nursing is for women and, and medicine is, you know, I'm just giving a hypothetical example. So you may get bits of information from there, but the scientific um, basis that I was talking about is actually measuring what impact this role modeling concept has had on, 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 on the girl child. Yeah. I think more than anything, it's more inspiring. Yeah, is that inspiration? Yeah, yes. It's a spark, and it, from there it can yeah. lead to so many different. Absolutely. Things. Yeah. Because prior to that, a lot of them have no concept. Not they have they've not met anybody, you know, in that kind of field before. So it really is that instant inspiration. Absolutely. That I can also be this 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 in yes. my life. Yeah. And yeah. from there, basically, hopefully, they'll get the support they need yeah. to actually achieve those ambitions and goals. Absolutely. But that's that int Instant inspiration, I think that exactly, gets exactly. From those programs. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Ariane. Ariane. Um, and do you so if you if you pick a few girls from a certain school, do you then tell them to spread the word back in the school and can, to be the spokesperson to kind of take the story? Back, absolutely the, the privileged ones who can get to exactly the exactly like I'm saying we are limited by numbers because of course um, how realistic is it to have 500 girls sitting in a room and so we're and that's exactly what I mean I, I meant to mention it of course I've forgotten that's fantastic that you've reminded me they are going to act as um, you know propagating the message mm. I went and I met this lady and I went and this woman said this and, and it's going to be done in an informal but in a very realistic way, you know, because, and that's one thing we don't have in Ghana much of, we don't have much of it, is the um, youth as in peer uh, um, relationships where one person is impacting. They're trying, I know the NGOs are trying and uh, people who are into girl child education are, are trying. However, that person who's the youth mentor has to 
be armed with the right information and not propagating the wrong information. You know, because if you, for example, you educate somebody on adolescent sexual health and tell them that don't go and get pregnant at the age of, of 14 because, you know, um, you have physical issues, which, uh, and of course, it's going to impact your, your school going and all of this. If you don't give them the right information, of course, you're going to propagate the wrong information. So we, that's why I'm trying to get a certain caliber of people who, w you know, would, would give them the right information. And hopefully, they should be able, we're going to hammer on that, that this is not just for the 20 girls from that school. However, you must try and spread the message. And this book, although we're going to give it to the 20 girls from each school, we're going to encourage the schools to try. I'm working, I forgot to mention that, with the Ghana Education Service, which is our education service back home. They're totally excited about it. So we're going to try and get the schools to get as many of them as possible. But you can't get every child. That will be my dream and my joy, to have every child read this book. But then they can also pass the book on and say that, oh, you know, Dr. Anda even had this issue and she failed an exam. It's not like she, you know, she just walked through it. So the book is going to help. But those 20 girls from each school is also going to be a positive thing where they're going to propagate the message, hopefully, mm. once they are armed with the right information. I think there's nothing better than having older children teaching younger children. Absolutely, that them. peer it, it it's makes it's it's a great it's a great them impact. Some leadership skills as well. Exactly, and I think that's a really good way of building. Getting them, yeah. yeah. So it's something we're going to zero in on. So what age group are you working with? We are looking at um, girls between the age of 15. This time it's just um, um, we have a system where you have primary, junior, secondary and senior secondary. And senior secondary normally starts from the age of about 14. Mm. So from this one we're going to be doing 14 till about 19. But the second part of the project, which you have to crawl before you walk, so the second part of the project is going to be for the tertiary um, um, level. Because trust me, even at that level, you still have people who don't know what they're about. You still have people who don't know what they want to do. You still have people who are just, you know, going through school because, you know, they, 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 they need to go through school. But older. that, um, yes, yeah. yes, older. But the younger ones, I think they are programs that are addressing their issues. You also don't want to bombard, that's what I find, the younger people with so much heavy going information that they may not you know, benefit from at, at this level. Because they are, they are now trying to find their feet. I have a 14 year old daughter and I'm using her as an example. And you know, when I told her to read my book, I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> my 10 year old daughter finished it in like two days. But my 14 year old was so distracted. I mean, it's really interesting. And then she's going like this and I said, I'm like, Weba, I think, you know, your friends would really benefit from, oh yes, yes. So she's happy to give the book out to her friends, but you know, there's that. So she's at that 13, 14, by the time you're 15, 16, 17, you're a, l a lot more focused and you know that you want to achieve. And therefore, when somebody's talking, you listen. You know, the 10 year old is a precocious 10 year old. So she's in a total class of her own, but you're looking at people who will appreciate what we're trying to do. So that's the age group we're looking at for now. <coughs> Just one other, sorry, quick, quick question about yes, the, the school because mm -hmm. I, uh, I have never been to Ghana, so I have no idea of the sort of internet AV facilities. Mm -hmm. Because what strikes me is that if they have any, that the concept of something like TED Talks, but delivered mm -hmm. to your kind of girls mm -hmm. through short kind of three, four minute videos of parts mm -hmm. of your speaking, mm -hmm. they're either accessible through lessons as videos or online is going to be hugely stimulating and what it means is I, I mean if I ever have 10 minutes there I'll watch a TED talk rather than go on the Daily Mail. It's a struggle but I try. <laughs> <laughs> um, and because I think it's better to gain something than to drain you of you know all these negative things we have in our society and if these girls had a way through the school, I'm guessing they don't all have computers at home or anything but if there's school facilities and your message can then be disseminated to the thousands and they can just refer people. They might not have 40 minutes, but they'll have time for your medical career Absolutely. and your Absolutely. story. And actually, you disseminate without even any more effort. Exactly. And I think yeah. there are programs like with Google, they're doing certain programs to, to reach 
small communities. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. by partnering with like ICT companies, mm -hmm. yeah, can actually manage to reach and impact so many more people. Mm -hmm through like you know e-learning yeah. and e -learning. unfortunately now i mean our schools as they stand now are a little limited with uh, with uh, yeah you know access they do have have computers don't get me wrong but if you have uh, for example um, 20 computers in a school where you have thousands of girls um, your access your time for for using the facility is a little limited with the day students they are, because trust me, I mean, quite a lot of them have access to either a telephone or, I mean, you go, come to Ghana now and in a marketplace, mobile phones are just like, so, and they, they are getting a lot more techy. And so when they are, when, as day students, it's great. However, this is fantastic and we're, we're going to, you know, it's, it's a very good idea. We're going to have these, like you're saying, three, four, five minutes you know, bits of information that we're going to put on there so that they can benefit even if it's during their holiday period. Because once they are aware of it, then they would want to go on it even during their, those in boarding schools. But those in day schools can do it uh, um, any time rather than um, Snapchatting and <laughs> <laughs> my daughter does that all the time. I don't even know anything about it, but I just know every second she's telling me, yeah, guess what this lady is doing? I'm thinking, who cares? You know, where? <laughs> Who cares what she's doing at this point in time? But she's like, but, but it's really interesting. But obviously, it didn't come in my time, so it's 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 a little awkward for me. But to encourage them to go and listen to these inspirational things, uh, you know, for a short period of time, I think it will very much benefit.